morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional People Training Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. We have two speakers for today. Jeff Odell is the Technical Marketing Manager for Lancus NA Disinfectants Business Line. He has over 16 years' experience in on-farm biosecurity protocols for cleaning and disinfection in the live animal production industry and emergency disease response. Stephen Wright is the Director of Food Processing for Sterilex and is an experienced food safety professional with a demonstrated history in sanitation, food safety, quality systems, and manufacturing. His career has focused on such key industry elements as food manufacturing operations management, food safety, food processing sanitation, hazard analysis, and critical control points, GMP implementation, process engineering management, and environmental health safety. And Stefan holds a master's degree in food science. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Jeff Odell. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. While Lanxus has a human health, aquaculture, horticulture, and companion animal business in regards to disinfection, our core business is really around live production, poultry and swine. Um, and with the focus of the topic today being on processing, my piece of, the, of this discussion is really going to be around the interface between that live production and the processing side. And we'll let Stefan talk to, uh, in regards to the, the processing piece. Okay, so why, why do we really care about uh, – I'm, I'm, my discussion is going to be around the transportation. So why do we really care about the transportation when those animals are a near end of life anyway? And uh, you're really not going to be too terribly concerned about viral challenges at, at processing. It's going to be more concerned with the foodborne pathogens such as salmonella. Uh, my interest really is how do we keep those trucks from bringing disease back to the farm? So um, we talk about bioexclusion, which is keeping pathogens out of the farm. Um, with fewer, there, with greater consolidation within the industry, we will see larger farms, more animals, higher densities. And even with COVID, we found that it's much easier to spread disease when there's a higher density of people in the same area. Um, so bioexclusion, we really, we, we really talk about the, uh, tr the diseases, the transboundary diseases. So uh, we're definitely worried about uh, African swine fever at this point, um, as it's been uh, nearly three years now going on through Asia and Eastern Europe. Um, we've got FMD, classic swine fever. Those are the three primary trans transboundary diseases. Uh, you might want to throw in uh, avian influenza there. But the emerging diseases and what is uh, significant in the swine industry today is a new variant of PERS, uh, the 144. It seems to be more virulent and more robust in the environment, so there's been some significant challenges in the swine industry around uh, PERS 144 at this point. And if we look at the endemic diseases on these farms, PERS is uh, probably the biggest concern. It costs the U.S. swine industry about $640 million annually in loss. Uh, that actually will equate to about $11 a head on finishers and about $350 per head on fowls. So if you had a 500 fowl operation, you're looking at a loss of about 175,000, and there's not too many farms that can withstand that amount of, of, of loss. So the other term that's used these days is biocontainment, so we're not spreading disease within or out of the farm. So we want to keep, them out, keep it out if we possibly can, and if we do get a, a break in a barn, we want to make sure that it doesn't spread within the farm or outside the farm. And how do we do that? We look at risk events. So anything and any time something comes onto the farm, that's considered a risk event. And those risk events are uh, you're basically looking at carrying agents. What could possibly bring a pathogen onto the farm? It could be replacement gilts. It could be semen. 
trucks, people, the feed that comes in, the air that comes in from, from outside. Uh, and in, on this picture, you see a single entrance coming onto the farm. So you have not only your feed trucks come in, um, your trucks that come in and pick up calls, uh, your employees' vehicles, all these things have the same driveway. So it's nearly impossible to uh, prevent disease from coming in unless you put some sort of disinfection station at the driveway where you can disinfect those, those wheels and those vehicles before you come in. This is just a typical a chart that you would look at, even just for a, a simple sow breeding herd. So these are the, all the different types of movements you have. You've got semen delivery, gilts, foals being removed, weaned pigs being removed. You've got feed deliveries. They're bringing in propane for, for fuel. They're taking the garbage out. There's deliveries of needles, tools, supplies, anything that could be used. The employees are, are coming into the farm. Those employees bring their own food for the most part. Um, they may go out at lunchtime. There's, there's repairmen that come in and, and fix equipment. Uh, any other types of vendors that you might have, veterinarians, uh, sales vendors, there's a lot of movement. Every one of these things that comes in every day is considered a risky event. So you could literally have thousands and thousands of risky events in the course of turning over one herd. Um, and then you also have uh, manure removal, wild animals that could possibly come in, and then the introduction of, of air, and even water. The water could, could potentially be contaminated. I like to use this chart as an example because it shows the, the PEDD outbreak of 2013, 2014. So the industry had approximately six months where there were fairly low number of cases of PEDD that broke, um, but then it really took off in October. And we correlate that to cold temperature. Now, either the farms had a complete breakdown in, in biosecurity. I mean, you have six months of advance notice. We would hope that everybody would strengthen their biosecurity protocols and really be on heightened alert. Uh, but this didn't happen in this case. And, and so we asked ourselves, were, what were those trucks disinfected with? Were they disinfected for one? And then what was the chemistry that was used to disinfect those trucks? Is it impacted by cold temperatures? Um, and is it effective against the pathogens that were of concern, and in, in this case, PEDV? Uh, primarily, the, the, the product of choice at that time was not labeled for PEDV. Um, the chemistry is known to be impacted by the cold temperature. And then um, was the marketing communications for a lot of the products being used, was that misleading? Was it misbranded to a point where it misled growers to believe that their products were efficacious when, in fact, they were not? This, the two examples there are for a, a phenolic spray that's used primarily for disinfection of the cabs of, of trucks and being promoted for not only PEDV but for PERS, in which case if you go to the EPA website and you look at the approved label, it has no approved claims for PERS or PED Day. So we, I, I go to a lot of conferences around the swine industry and I hear a lot about seasonal outbreaks. And yeah, there are, you have animals that are in high density in, in more closed areas and there's greater stresses, but is that really the cause of the outbreak or are we not doing a good job disinfecting those trucks? And I think the industry will, will, will recognize that transportation is a, a main vector for the, for the disease spread. So again, we're not so much interested, at least on my side of the house, we're not so much interested in taking disease to the, the processing plants we're more interested in bringing disease back from the processing plant to the farm. Um, 
in the case of a, of a major outbreak of something like avian influenza or African swine fever, we're not going to transport those animals anyway. Those animals are going to be culled on the farm and disposed of either by composting, uh, burial, or whatnot, incineration and whatnot. So we would not expect any of, of sick animals in that case to go to processing, even though ASS does not affect humans and can be uh, detected in processed meat, those animals um, should not go to processing. Our experience in uh, specifically Asia and Thailand, in this case the pictures from Thailand, um, you see that the disinfection of those trucks would be either a bay uh, or even just a simple spray of the, of the tires and the wheel wells coming into the farm. The procedures that are used for the disinfection of, of trucks are primarily you want to do a dry clean, you want to remove the bedding and any bulk organic material. If, if available, you want to pre-wet or soak those uh, soils so that they can be loosened. Use a commercial detergent to help break the surface tension. Um, using the commercial detergent will typically break the surface tension by at least half, making those soils easier to, to release. Um, you want to use low pressure, start from the outside in, from the front to the back, and from the floor to the ceiling when you're spraying the, the cleaner. After the cleaner has had a sufficient time for resonance, we want to go in and we want to rinse from the outside top down and then clean the cab. Don't forget the cutting boards, the paddles, coveralls, boots, any other types of equipment that are used also need to be disinfected. And we find that very often that those paddles and, and boards, even at the farm, uh, are rarely disinfected. They're used, but then they just kind of get put to the side. We concentrate on cleaning the houses, but, but uh, a lot of times those materials are, are not uh, properly cleaned. We want to apply disinfectant, uh, and then they'll, they'll pull those vehicles out and put them on an incline so they can drain and dry. Very rarely, I think, that, it, that uh, culture or monitoring of ATP is, is done, but that is an option that is available. And then in the U.S. as well, we're starting to see more and more of uh, thermal-assisted uh, drying where those, those trailers are baked. And really, it comes down to the better job that you can do in cleaning the fewer number of organisms that are there, it makes it easier for the disinfectant to be effective. And some of the questions that uh, I received prior to this discussion is how do we decontaminate when you have the same entry and exit at the plant or in limited space? Uh, rarely, at least internationally, we have we seen there be decontamination going into the plant or um, leaving the plant. A lot of times those trucks, in, and in my, in my experience, will leave the processing plant and drive, to, especially for a large integrator, would drive to a, a company truck wash or a commercial truck wash where those vehicles will be uh, cleaned and disinfected. But again, you still might have the same entry and exit. Um, a lot of times those, those truck washes are located outside of where your primary housing for, for swine is going to be, and, and they'll have gravel driveways. You're going to have a lot of dust in, uh, when those trucks pull in. And again, you might see at the farm level uh, where the, the driver will actually get out and disinfect those manually using uh, a pump-up sprayer, disinfect truck tires or, or incoming vehicle tires. Another question we got was, can you reuse the water that, that's used in the truck wash? And this was a trial that was done in Thailand as well, where they used Burkhanes to, to disinfect the trucks. Um, the fresh solution that was being used in this case was at a 1 to 200 dilution. I believe this was for an application to prevent ASF. Our, our dilution rates outside the U.S. go as high as 1 to 800 on ASF. Um, and here they were looking at what is the concentration using using the test strip, what is the concentration of that wastewater afterwards? And it really got down to about a 1 to 1,000 dilution. So you would either, if you were going to reuse the solution, 
um, which we probably would not recommend, you would have to add additional product to bump that, that active oxygen content back up to at least the 1 to 200 uh, concentration. I think more what we see is in the wastewater is what impact is it going to have on wastewater treatment. So that water, you want it to be biodegradable. You don't want it to be able to go to wastewater treatment and kill all the bugs in the plant. Especially in the U.S., I think most most truck washes are going to have containment of the water and then disposal. And then what, the final question we had really was around the corrosivity of these products. Most concentrated disinfectants, and especially cleaners uh, in this industry, are corrosive to some extent. So you have, for barn soils, where you would have a removal of feces in these trucks, um, those cleaners that work most effectively on those types of soils are going to be highly alkaline, um, and you will see some corrosivity on certain metals. Now, what we try to do is minimize that corrosivity um, by either using lower concentration, um, you can put um, corrosion-resistant materials in with those cleaners to help, but for the most part, you're still going to see some either discoloration or minor corrosivity on especially soft metals, something like a brass, copper, uh, galvanized steel, or mild steel, you might see a little bit, but but soft metals primarily. In this study, what we did was we actually sprayed um, a variety of different metals with the, the recommended label use rates of certain products. And specifically, there really was no difference between using water, um, well, use the, the water alone as, as a control was, was different than using the, the different uh, cleaners and, or the different disinfectants, but uh, it also was compared to what we typically see as road salt conditions in, say, the Midwest in, in, in February. And the results in loss of metal was really statistically insignificant. And again, you see from the pictures there where we're looking at um, an oxidative chemistry like Burkhan S versus road salt versus a glutaraldehyde, quaternary ammonium, and the, the bottom right-hand side would be a, an accelerated hydrogen peroxide. So. We want to make sure that if we can lower the concentration and still be effective, that helps improve not only the economic use of the product, but it should lower the corrosivity as well. Faster contact times where we don't need to leave it on there for extended periods. Um, and then we also want to make sure that the products are, are effective at cold temperature. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it to Stefan so he can uh, focus more on the processing side of the house. Stefan, please. Appreciate it, Jeff. Um, and there's a lot of themes that kind of overlap um, with what you've kind of presented. And then on the processing side, one key thing I want to bring up as we start out is, you know, you talked about um, the cross-contamination back to the farm from the facility. And so that's, that's a big concern that the facilities have, either from incoming from the actual truck itself but also downstream as you get into further processing, pack out things of that nature. So that's a common theme that's gonna ride throughout the uh, entire presentation here. Um, so today I kind of wanted to walk through the seven steps of sanitation I have here plus one, um, but it's really plus one and a half if we talk about um, continual protection throughout production. Um, so we'll start out by kind of getting um, into some basic terminology and kind of walk through some EPA one-on-one. Um, so if we talk about decontamination, um, you know, that, that term is used a lot, especially on the processing side. I know Jeff just spoke to it uh, on the uh, upstream side. But it, it's really the naturalization or removal of those dangerous substances, right? Radioactivity or germs from any particular area, object, or person. Uh, the key thing in this entire definition here is Area, object, or person, right? Any type of vector that could be a source of cross-contamination, whether it's equipment, whether it's an animal, um, whether it's uh, an object that's used in processing, or the actual people that are um, within the facility. So if we, if we move into registered products, you know, uh, everyone talks a lot about EPA registrations. 
and what is the value of a registered product. And really, to me, it's, it's a number of things, but most importantly, um, it's validated control of specific uh, organisms, right? So the EPA is, any, any EPA registered product is gonna have some type of validated control claim for fungi, for molds, yeast, um, different viruses, um, and then, you know, bacteria and bacterial biofilm. Um, of course, biofilm is, is the one particular section that we'll add is that plus one in our seven steps of sanitation. Um, but the power of an EPA registration really allows you to um, use data to support what it is that you're doing inside that facility to control um, what might be here in front of you today. So if we walk through some other key terms that are most commonly um, associated on the production side, well, really on both sides, but uh, the, the terminology and language that we build a lot of our programs on. Um, we'll start with sanitization, right? So um, on the processing side, that's gonna result in a five log reduction of that bacteria population on food contact surfaces. So anything that's coming in direct contact um, with what will be consumed as far as the food product is concerned, whether it's ready to eat, whether it's a raw product, does not really differentiate there. Um, but it, anything that's um, being applied at a sanitization rate or achieving sanitization um, level claims is gonna be that five log reduction. Um, if we are talking about non-food contact surfaces, so your drains, your floors, your walls, your ceilings, anything that is of that structure that surrounds those uh, contact surfaces, even if it's framework, legging, things, uh, legging, structures, struts, things of that nature, um, sanitization is claimed at a three log reduction of that bacteria population. And really the differentiation there is, um, you know, risk-based. Uh, what is actually coming in contact with products and what is just in the particular environment that could be a vector for cross-contamination. At the sanitization level, we are not seeing any inactivation of viruses. That's, that's something key to note as we walk through this entire um, sanitation process or, or cleaning and sanitation process. Um, claims at the sanitization level are not gonna allow you any inactivation of viruses. Um, and in most surfaces, uh, almost in all circumstances, are not rinsed after the application of a sanitizer, regardless of if it's food contact or you know, your non-food contact environmentals. So if we transition into disinfection, right, that's the upgraded sanitization. This is gonna result in a six log reduction, right? So one more log of that bacterial population being removed on all surfaces, regardless of if they're food contact or non-food contact. The EPA kind of draws a hard line on disinfection just because of the level of uh, population decrease and in, in the case of um, biofilms removal. So on food contact surfaces, it must be rinsed. I mean, there is some flexibility on non-food contact surfaces, especially if they're, uh, you know, what we refer to as zone threes or zone fours on the processing side, far outside of those food contact surfaces. Um, it's recommended to rinse them, um, more so I think for health safety perspective, uh, from the health safety perspective, um, but also for potential cross-contamination with food contact surfaces, but it's not always a must. Um, here is where we see those inactivation of viruses, right? So here's where you start to see your virucidal claims um, and, and usually defined on those non-porous surfaces. So disinfection is really what gets you to that point of I can claim control of this particular virus. I can, can uh, claim removal of this particular virus. Or in the case of biofilms, there's a hard line on what you can and can't claim um, based on sanitization versus disinfection rate of log reduction. So what to look for in a label? Um, there's a number of things that are key when you're looking at an EPA registered label, um, but a few that I really want to point out, I guess the uh, the conversation that we have most commonly is if it's not on that label, then you, you can't claim efficacy against it. Is there the potential for it to be effective? Absolutely. But in, in, in the eyes of the law, um, it's, you know, it, you can't claim it unless it's on that particular label. Um, there's a couple of key things that are always going to be on, um, on an EPA registered label that you should look out for. One is that EPA registration number. I know the visual here is very small. I'll get into a breakout in a second. 
but that registration number as well as revision so that you're working off the most up-to-date information that's available for that particular product. Um, and then also how you're using the actual application uh, and concentrations, the, the surfaces that it can be applied to, what are you trying to control and what concentration is necessary for you to match the claims that are associated with that particular level. Um, here's kind of a better visual, but a few key things to point out that I just kind of mentioned is, you know, what, what are you looking for? Are you looking to control viruses? Are you, what is the specific virus? Is there a specific concentration uh, application mecha uh, mechanism? Um, what, what are the specifics that allow you to, um, with validated EPA data, say that I'm controlling this particular virus inside this facility? Um, another key thing to mention is those application instructions, because again, uh, the, the validation of the effectiveness against these particular viruses that you're finding on your label or that are associated with this particular registration are all backed up by those application instructions. It's been proven over and over and, and almost to death to a certain extent um, that um, you, can re you can achieve these results in a repeatable fashion with these application instructions. There's a, there's a number of different claim types as well. Like, like I had kind of mentioned, you know, you might have a particular concentration that will allow you sanitization claims against this particular organism or disinfection claims against this virucidal biofilm, so on and so forth. That's why it's, it's very critical if you're expanding your application or if you come across a particular contaminant that's maybe new to your facility or that now you're controlling, that you refer back to those EPA registered labels so that you know exactly how to target them with um, a validated approach. So now I'm gonna transition into just an overview of the steps of sanitation. Some of this will, will uh, is probably uh, very common to a lot of you guys, but I really wanna uh, focus on that disinfection piece as an added step that's not necessarily required, but really overall, um, creates a more robust protection for that entire program. So again, as I mentioned, it's the seven steps of sanitation plus that one. Um, and the one that I have called out here is that disinfection piece that we've kind of laid the groundwork for. But we'll walk through, um, you know, your common breakdown and dry pickup, um, your detergents that are going to be focused on achieving one particular key aspect of that sanitation process, um, rinsing of that particular detergent, that disinfection piece will go into kind of um, some detail on why it's important and how it supports the other steps in that process. Rinsing and assembling, the pre-op inspection, and then of course um, your leave-on sanitizers as I kind of alluded to um, earlier in the presentation. So what is a, a breakdown and dry clean? First off, I will say the first two to three steps are the ones that are most highly neglected in a facility, regardless of where you're at. It doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, incoming to harvest, if it's immediate post-harvest, if it's further processing, if it's pack out, this seems to be the step that is most commonly overlooked or cut short as far as time is concerned. And that really builds a, a rocky foundation for the rest of the process to be successful. Um, I'll get into that a little more when we talk about, um, you know, access to the surface for biofilm removal chemistries. And so the, the, the pace that this sets and the focus that needs to be in these first three steps really is going to determine a lot of the effectiveness and success, regardless of the product or regardless of the approach downstream. Um, but that breakdown and dry cleanup is usually going to consist of some pre-sanitation tasks, right? On the uh, EHS front, we're going to lock, we're going to tag out, and we're going to start disassembling our equipment, um, making sure that anything that can be removed, if it's feasible, can be removed from the process, cleaned in a particular area later, or um, staged at least for replacement and kind parts if there are multiple um, uh, replacement parts for that particular piece of equipment. Um, at this point too, and maybe even somewhat earlier, you're gonna assemble those sanitation uh, supplies. So making sure that you have all your parts in place, making sure that you have all of your chemistries ready, any tool that you're gonna need um, before you move into sanitation kind of fits into this step one as well. We, uh, the biggest, the, the key thing here is to remove those loose soils. Um, anything that, it, that uh, could consume chemistries or could consume additional um, labor or hand scrubbing or elbow grease or however you want to define it, 
anything that could um, consume those later on in the process, it's key to remove those up front. And then lastly, as far as environmentals are concerned, cleaning those drain baskets and getting any gross bulk debris away from your process so that you can start to put your labor and your uh, chemistries um, into effect. So the next would be that pre-detergent rinse, right? So you're trying to remove as much of those visible soils as possible. As possible. I mean, here I call out 95%. I think that's, that's an ideal approach. I don't think we always get to that. But the more you can remove here, the more effective your program is going to be long-term, as I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, here you're going to want to use hot water, of course, for a lot of those fats, oils, grease, anything that could be um, a little trickier to get away from a surface. Um, and then some boosted pressures. There's two caveats that I will call out. You know, we don't want to get too hot with our water and potentially burn some of those fats, oils, and greases to the surface, right? That could create problems for us further downstream. And then with the boosting of pressure, you really don't want to be in the, what would be considered like a pressure washing or high pressure systems, because that has a tendency to aerosolize, whether it's micros, whether it's um, your soil contaminants, and that could cause more environmental issues. So you want the water to be hot and you want some boosted pressures to help you um, to help you do that initial removal, but we need to stay within range so that we don't create more problems for ourselves uh, downstream in the process, uh, especially on the microbial front with boosted pressures. So the detergent step, right? So we wash with an appropriate detergent, right? And as Jeff alluded to a lot of time, a lot in his presentation, it's really going to depend on the makeup of that environment, right? So, what um, what are we targeting? What are we targeting? Is it fats? Is it protein? Is it blood? Is it food soils? You know, what exactly in there are we trying to remove from the surface? And what is the material makeup of that surface, right? Um, so, there's a lot of different uh, uh, detergents, chlorinated alkaline cleaners, general purpose cleaners that are applied here, and they're really um, targeted towards what soil we're removing and the environment that it's being applied in. Is, are there soft metals? Are there polys? Are there um, some galvanized surfaces that maybe haven't been maintained? Those all might influence what is chosen here um, to start that uh, removal of those, um, of those uh, soils. Uh, also, too, one thing to note is that you know, it's very important, too, based on where you're located in the world and what the water supply is, what detergent you choose, right? So water quality, as, I'm, as everyone's aware, really has a pretty um, strong impact on the efficacy of different chemistries and also the way that they're applied within that facility. Um, so, again, part of that step is that, is that uh, what we call the, you know, the pie graph of, of sanitation, right? So you need those four particular um, items in order to be effective in sanitation. That's time, temperature, action, uh, and your chemical concentration. So all variables are needed. Um, however, they might fluctuate based on, you know, we have to create the entire pie, but they might fluctuate on what uh, is your larger section. So let's say maybe we, we're running a little bit lower on time. Well, we might need to increase our chemical concentration, but again, it has to be referred back to that label for disinfectants and sanitizers. Maybe we don't, maybe we have plenty of time, our concentrations are lower on the, you know, fluorinated alkaline front. Well, maybe we need more hand scrubbing. Maybe we need more action or active scrubbing of that particular surface. So we have to create that entire pie, but the actual size of the individual pieces can fluctuate based on the setup in your facility or what you're targeting. Um, after we've done that original uh, that uh, original gross removal of soils, we've applied our fluorinated alkaline for the removal of those fats, oils, and greases. Now we have to remove that detergent residue. As I mentioned earlier, you know most of your general purpose cleaners are not going to have any particular claim against bacteria or against viruses. Their sole purpose is to remove those soils from the surface so that then we have some a, a foundation to start the removal of microbes, to start the removal of those viruses. So we have to wash all of that from the actual surface. Here, very same guidance, your water is going to stay at that higher temperature for ease, of, um, for ease of use, and then also those pressures just for removal. So now, again, as an optional step to this, and the most important, of course, in, in my mind, 
is that disinfection, virucidal treatment, and then biofilm removal, especially on the processing side. It is an optional step. It's not legally required, but in order to achieve your sanitation goals, to get ready for startup, and then also create kind of like a baseline for you to be successful continuously as you implement all these steps, it's kind of critical um, in, in the entire process. So as I mentioned earlier, um, claims are regulated by the EPA as far as disinfection is concerned. So um, you have to prove that efficacy, go through EPA registrations in order for it to be on that particular label so that you, you know, what you're physically doing with the product in an environment is backed up by validated information. Um, so biofilm removal and any type of viral control are regulated in this particular step of the sanitation process within the processing environment. As I mentioned earlier, this is where we're getting that sixth law removal of microorganisms. And as I mentioned as well, all disinfectants are required to be rinsed on food contact surfaces for a number of different reasons, but mostly because once you've removed anything from that surface, it's key that it's that it's dissolved and it's pushed away from the surface and it can't remain intact for repopulation purposes. So when we think specifically about biofilms, right, those, I don't want to use it as a tagline or as a key phrase that's used most often, but there's a reason for that. And it's because, um, you know, in the form of a biofilm, and I have the definition up here, but in the form of a biofilm, we see extreme resistance of microorganisms to other types of chemistry, other types of cleaning, and in systems that don't have a full disinfection step. Um, so just as a simple definition here, a biofilm is going to be those grouping of cells that stick together. They're embedded in that polymeric substance that's composed of proteins, different polysaccharides, other materials. I mean, the layman term that I always, example that I give everyone is, you know, by myself walking down the street, Stefan is only so resistant to the, the elements of Mother Nature, right? Um, rain, wind, severe temperature, you know, they're, they're very quickly going to take their toll on me as one particular individual. Now, if I were with my family and I was in a structure that was built or a home that we had produced for ourselves, our resistance to those, um, uh, those elements are, you know, tremendously higher, right? So, I mean, we're, you know, no longer am I concerned with, um, with the volume of rain to a certain extent. No longer are extreme fluctuations in temperature going to impact me and, of course, the family I built my home with um, because we have that support structure and we have that, um, that uh, protection. And that's really the easiest way to explain a biofilm, especially for those that are carrying out a lot of these tasks inside food processing facilities. Um, together as a group with this produced matrix, they, there's extreme resistance to what we're trying to control them with. And that's why having an EPA registered and uh, approved biofilm removal chemistry is key. So again, it's the natural habitat, habitat for biofilms, right? Um, all organisms, microorganisms naturally create biofilms. They're all multi-species. You're never going to see one particular just listeria biofilm or just salmonella biofilm unless they're created in a lab. That's not feasibly how they are um, in naturally occurring in the environment. Um, they express, as I mentioned earlier, extreme resistance in this particular biofilm format to um, your standard antimicrobials. Um, and then conventional disinfectants, again, like I said, have very limited efficacy or effectiveness against biofilms just because the way they're designed for protection naturally. Um, especially on the food processing side, there's a number of, uh, uh, of key indicators that we use as an evidence of biofilm that could be seeding a particular area or that are, um, you know, intermittently creating issues on that processing side um, for, you know, as far as control is concerned. Uh, you know, in extreme cases, we will see like a visual or a rainbow appearance um, if we talk about some organoleptic signs. Um, there is a slimy feel sometimes that is on equipment surfaces. And then there can be, and this is more in extreme circumstances, um, under maintained circumstances, a sour or musty odor. More so, I will say, um, it are the an analytical signs, right? So we have a, a spike in APC count. Maybe there is in, uh, an increase in some of your environmental E. coli, e. coli positives, salmonella positives, whatever they might be in the environment that you're testing for. Um, and then, you know, just like I said, increased um, 
uh, total plate counts and, and things of that nature. And then lastly, and the most un unfortunate, is when we start to see issues in our product itself, right? That's, that's the last place we ever want to see it. But it can be sometimes an indicator that upstream we have um, work to do. Uh, so a loss in shelf life, right? So if you have a product that has a standard shelf life that you established for it and you've verified and validated that that's what it is under your current circumstances, um, you, you know, if you're seeing a reduction in that, it could be an indicator that you have a biofilm within your system. Spoilage, and then of course micro failures and um, quality holds or, or reclassing or whatever the case may be in your facility. So how do we treat them? Um, you know, the number one thing I always mention to everybody, I alluded to it earlier in the presentation, is hand scrubbing. I mean, there, there's really no um, replacement out there, regardless of, almost regardless of what chemistry you're using, um, that can outpace hand scrubbing. Um, just because there is that physical agitation and that physical removal from the surface that's generated by that elbow grease. Um, the problem with most facilities, every facility, any facility I've ever seen, is that it is impossible to scrub every surface. I mean, we can, we can break equipment down, we can soak equipment, we can um, clean it in place, but there's always going to be a niche, um, whether it's within product contact areas or whether it's in environmental areas, that are just feasibly not capable of being hand scrubbed. Um, and so another uh, approach that's most commonly used is to try to burn off the biofilm. Um, but again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, this is extremely high doses of an antimicrobial or of an oxidizer. You know, it could be up to a thousand times the normal use rate of a sanitizer to chemically burn off some of the surface of that biofilm, and it's never gonna remove that structure. Um, and, and the key to really um, microbial control on that food processing side, whether it's directly at incoming or further downstream, is the removal of that biofilm. Because if, if you leave a structure intact, the replication of microbes within that structure is, is as quick as within 24 hours. But if you're removing that structure, then any microbe that comes into the environment that starts to set up shop that wants to, um, you know, find its homestead there and build its own biofilm has to start from scratch. So the removal of that structure is really what's key there. And in this burn off application, you're definitely not gonna see the removal of that structure. So the replication and, and the reoccurring issues will occur, like I said, in most cases within 24 to 48 hours, as opposed to when, that, when they're starting from ground zero and they're regenerating their biofilms for protection. Um, and then, you know, that kind of alludes to kind of those EPA-registered biofilm removal disinfection chemistries, because, you know, as I've outlined, the removal of the structure itself is, uh, is very key. And then lastly, uh, or sorry, uh, step six would be to rinse and assemble, right? You're going to rinse that disinfectant from the surface. As I mentioned, it must be removed from any uh, product contact area. And then verify that the chemical residue is removed. You know, there's a number of ways you can do that. It could be a visual inspection. It could be um, with some type of pH strip or some type of uh, quat strip or whatever the case may be for that particular chemistry. Removing all of your standing water um, and condensation, as those can be vectors for cross-contamination once production starts. Uh, put on clean outerwear, and that's more so for the particular people that are performing uh, sanitation further downstream or, or the application of leave-on sanitizers. Cleaning that particular in individual, sanitizing any parts that have been removed uh, that are going to be required to be reassembled later. And then, you know, visibly inspecting that equipment um, as you assemble it. So if there is any particular recleaning, um, disinfection, or soil removal, you can get that handled before you move into the next step. Um, step seven would be the pre-op inspection. Inspect equipment to ensure that it's free of chemicals, tools, and cleaning supplies. Of course, that's health safety related, but also on the food safety front um, and part of your management system in most cases. You're going to run that equipment prior to hygienic inspection. Complete your formal you know, pre-ops as they're spelled out in those SSOP or, or your pre-op procedure. Um, any type of microbial or hygienic testing as far as ATPs are concerned or swabs or whatever your indicator is for success so far in the process, those are going to want to be facilitated here. Um, if there's any deficiency that you have come across, um, make sure that we're providing feedback to the responsible person, whether it needs to be addressed right then and there or whether it's something that as we get into our next cycle, we're going to um, 
you know, increase this particular focus on this, or maybe we've fallen short here and this is what's going to create best practice moving forward. Um, Pre-op the facility regularly for all deficiencies, whether that's in the particular area that you're in, or if it's in outlying areas, or if it's in um, adjacent areas that maybe you're upstream or downstream, you know, it's a good opportunity here to kind of see what could impact this area, much to like Jeff's point, you know, when they're bringing um, items into a facility, the facility has to take that into concern. And even on the live side, as that truck leaves, now we have the reverse um, impact, and they have to take that into consideration, too, for best practices moving forward. Um, and then documentation, of course, right, because the saying goes, if it's not documented, then it didn't happen. And that's, it's key not only for, uh, to make sure that we're managing and monitoring our programs as they're laid out, but also uh, so that we, if there is any particular um, you know, deficiency or if we do have to circle back to what could have been a fault in our process, we have documentation of that. And then lastly is that no rent sanitizer. Um, and, and this is a legal requirement on the processing side. So make sure that there is no standing water before we begin production. Um, you'll, you'll flood that entire piece of equipment bottom to top with a no rinse concentration, again, linked back to that EPA registered label, and make sure that there's, there's no standing sanitizer. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, but again, you don't want the, the entire area to be saturated under most circumstances um, after the, uh, the actual process has been implemented. Um, equipment should be running to shed that excess sanitizer. Um, you're going to apply sanitizers to the entire process, right? So that's, you know, a minimum of five feet up on those walls, those outlying areas that could be um, potential cross-contamination issues as you get further into processing, right? Think of this as an entire, um, you know, everything should be a lab setting, honestly. Um, one would be uh, the, the piece of equipment that you're working on, but that the environment that surrounds it doesn't possibly become a source of contamination. Um, work your way out of the room so that there's no, uh, you know, cross-contamination based on foot traffic and, and the, the uh, pathways of personnel, and then letting it air dry or and squeegeeing any of those pooled sanitizers. The most common, of course, here are going to be your oxidizers, your PAAs, your bleach, your chlorine dioxide, and then there's some non-oxidizer versions, and I know Jeff alluded to this earlier too, but depending on what's specific for your particular area. I mean, you know, quat might not necessarily be something that's applicable in your, um, in your area based on wastewater concerns, um, but again, there are some different options based on where your facility's at and, and some of the, the stressors there. So the 1.5 that I kind of alluded to earlier is managing, uh, you know, across and between those sanitation events. Um, entryways, and high traffic areas are usually called out whenever we're completing audits or whenever we're walking through faults in a process. Those tend to be almost the number one source of contamination, right? It didn't exist in this environment. We were doing a good job with our seven plus one steps of sanitation in this facility, and then all of a sudden we have an event, right? Or all of a sudden we have um, a, a new source of contamination to us at least. And that's usually tied back to those entryways, right? Uh, as I've said over and over, as a vector of cross-contamination to a process you were managing. Um, doorways and entry foamers, um, based on just the type of environment, if it's an extremely wet environment, seem to be, um, you know, the forerunner as far as control for those cross-contaminations, but also powdered sanitizers. So solid powdered sanitizers, uh, as the graphic on the right shows, um, especially at those, let, you know, those dock and those offload areas. They're easy to apply. Um, they have, uh, you know, fairly extended efficacy as far as control and label claims are concerned. Um, they're easier kind of to manage, a lot more hands-off. Um, and then they also track a little better than liquids do into those, you know, harvest areas and then even further into processing. So creating those barriers, whether it's from one department to the next, or if it's at uh, truck offload into further processing, can be key in um, supporting or uh, honestly maintaining all the work that you've done downstream. You know, we just walked through um, all of the steps associated with an effective program, and you don't want to lose any of that integrity and the hard work that you've put into that established and continued to implement by having a breach at an entryway or having a breach between a raw area and a finished area or whatever the case may be. 
Um, again, remembering here that because of what they're doing, what they're controlling, what they're claiming, and the intent of these products at entryways, it should be an EPA-registered product for the control of micros. And so, um, Liz, Jeff, that, that is it for me. Um, I, uh, I guess at this point, I'll toss it back over to you and we can start working through um, any questions that might exist. That would be great. Thank you for your time Thanks, today. Um, Stefan. Yeah, that would be great. Um, Barb Porter Folding wants to thank you so much for your willingness to conduct this webinar for the TEP. So your efforts are much appreciated. I want to just pass that along to you. The first question we have in the chat is, what are some of the corrosive reducer materials you have tried and which were more effective? That's a good question. There's a, there's a lot of different corrosion inhibitors that are on the market, and it really, like, like Stefan said, it really depends on the, the type of metal in the process that you're going to be dealing with. Um, and the, the, the different type of soil types. So you, for the barn soils and the proteins and the fats, you're going to use something that's going to be more highly alkaline, whereas for mineral scale, you're going to be acidic. Um, if, for example, typically in a, in a poultry hatchery, you would run three weeks cleaning the hatchery with an alkaline product, then you'd come back with an, with an acidic product, just because if you use the acidic product all the time, you're going to eat up your, your materials a lot quicker, even though a lot of the materials are going to be stainless steel. Um, it's really when you get down to mild steel or uncoated galvanized, uh, the, the soft metals like brass and copper is where you're going to find more of your corrosivity. Um, but there are a lot of different in corrosion inhibitors that are available on the market, and it really is when you're formulating one of these products, it's a real balance as to what do you want to really deliver. Um, and a lot of people will look at uh, cleaning and disinfection as it's, it's really kind of a pain in the rear end. We do so much better cleaning in Canada than we do in the U.S. There's a real focus to clean and then disinfect, whereas in the U.S. it's kind of okay, we'll power wash it, and then we'll put down some disinfectant and hope for the best. And what we see is in those areas where you have higher value animals, they'll do a lot better job in cleaning and disinfection. So if it's involving genetic stock, sparrowing, um, weaned piglets, uh, feeders, you're going to do a lot better job cleaning and disinfection there than you're going to do at finishing or, um, you know, where you have the removal of cold sows um, or market hogs. It just, the higher the value of the animal, the, the more of uh, the effort that, that takes place. Okay, the next question is, can biofilms be physically scrubbed off? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I actually saw that question come in as we were going through the presentation and my next slide was, you know, as the biofilm guy, I mean, my number one thing is, if you can scrub it, let's scrub it, because that's going to be the most effective means. It's just not usually physically possible or feasible in all, you know, for every little nook, cranny, niche. But yes, biofilm, as far as scrubbing is concerned, that's your, your number one approach. Okay, as long as you can get is for Jeff. As long as, oh, go ahead. As long as you can get to it. Yes, as long as you can get to it. And, <laughs> right. and I will... I will say, you know, as I mentioned multiple times, and Jeff just brought it back up, it's the access to that surface, right? So if you have all of those gross soils, you know, in the states he mentioned, if we're not doing a good job of removing the bulk of those soils, then you're not going to have access to that surface with your hand scrubbing for a lot of that biofilm removal. So it's key that it's done in order, but, yes, if you have access to the surface in a clean means, if you will, then they can be physically scrubbed off. All right, this next question is for Jeff. Um, and in your experience, where is the best place to clean trucks that are moving from harvest facilities back to farms, especially if independent truckers and not part of a company or system? Yeah, excellent question, because really the best place to do uh, truck wash and disinfection would be at the at the processing plant in a remote area of the plant where you make sure that you clean, you disinfect 
You, you may even do a thermal uh, assisted drying where you're not taking that truck out onto the highway where it's going to be on the same roads that other trucking that's hauling animals is going to be. Um, and it, it kind of is mind-boggling that with a $640 million loss to the industry on PERS alone, that we would not have come up with a better way to prevent it being spread. And I, the, the industry, when I go to the Lehman Swine Conference or – uh, the AASB, they always talk about how transportation really is, gets the blame. You know, if, if you're having problems in the poultry house, hatchery, they're not going to say it's the hatchery. They're going to they're blame it on the layers coming in and the eggs that are coming from the farm. Um, the farms are saying, well, we're, we're doing a great job doing our biosecurity here. had to be a failure with, with something coming in. Um, but I think the industry in – um, for the most part, would agree that transportation is one of the big vectors for um, transmission of disease. But I would, okay. I would say, if you, is, if you, if you could do it in, a, if you could, if you could do those trucks in a remote area prior to leaving and going onto onto public highways and roads, that would be the best place to do it. Okay. Um, the next question is for Stefan. Can you address standard and enhanced protocols for lariage in animal unloading areas if a plant is in an ASF area? So, um, you know, the approach, we, we kind of take a twofold approach. Um, if we talk about an enhanced protocols, it would be a total disinfection of that particular area. So it, regardless of what, what product selected, it would be, as top to bottom from the start of the process to when it's handed over to uh, whatever the next phase is in that, in that processing cycle. Um, but it, the, the, the key difference is the, the number of times that you're cleaning that surface with a disinfectant, and actually my phrasing there is improper. The, the number of times that you're disinfecting that surface is really what's going to determine enhanced versus, you know, just your normal protocol. So, for instance, let's say that there's – you're in an ACF or I'm in an ASF area, and you, you know, it's confirmed in this particular uh, operation from from top to bottom, whether it's air that's coming into the facility, if it's an air handling unit, if it's just equipment along the way, if it stalls, if it's loadout, whatever the case may be, it's the number of times you're going to do the label claimed um, application that's going to set you back to what would be a ground zero, so that then you can go back to less frequent maybe lower volume depending on the label application for your maintenance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we'll let you know. Okay. There's another okay. question in the chat. In your experience, how effective would heat treatment be in disinfection? Well, it is used in, in the trucking industry for baking the trailers. So I've got uh, – uh, they say for ASF in particular, if you can bake those trailers for five-minute contact time at 145 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 60 degrees C, you'll kill the virus. Mostly they'll run um, in that 145 to 160 degree temperature for about 20 minutes to ensure that they do a disinfection. And then – and then just to add on the processing side, I mean, there's a number of things that I mentioned is, one, if you, if you haven't removed a lot of those soils and you haven't actually gotten a lot of that off of the surface, then heat treatment can actually be counteractive, right? You could burn things onto the so – even with steam, you could burn things onto that surface that are going to be long-term problems um, and, and kind of, you know, create more issues with you for you downstream. The other thing that's a lot difficult in a processing environment is just – the feasibility of, of doing heat treatment um, in those particular areas, whether you're, you know, I, I can't think of any particular plant that's, that's invested entirely in, in being able to lock down and, and melt away anything that's in that facility. So when you talk about spot treating with heat in areas, you know, I don't know if it's physically feasible, but also, you know, I think things would tend to move around because you're not doing it entirely in one particular treatment, if that makes sense. Excellent point, Stefan, because um, I use the example when I'm, I talk about pre-soaking is if that 
soil has been dried on or baked on. And a perfect example is you have spaghetti dinner and you leave the dishes out overnight. You, you're going to have to soak them in the morning before you can get those soils off. So if you're actually taking, you have you've done a inadequate job in cleaning, you're going to make matters worse by baking it on. The other issue around the baking too is is you're talking an extra step, more time, and an energy intensive process. It's going to cost money, and a lot of these. To imagine trying to bake a 52 foot trailer is going to take some substantial uh, financial investment to do that. And one last key thing we we both talked about it is. You know, your disinfectant is targeted at, you know, the micros or whatever the load is that's on that surface. And if there's a soil presence, right, whether it's baked on or whether it just exists, you know, it has a tendency to consume some of those active uh, materials that are doing the disinfecting. And so the efficacy and the effectiveness starts to drop back. And, and that would be my, my last comment on the heat treating is if, if you have something that's sealed to that surface, you know, you're minimizing your ability to approach it with a disinfectant. Okay. One, one, th I, one other thing I'll mention too is what I have seen at, at truck washes at, at one of the long, very large integrators was the chemistry that was being used. If the if the operators don't feel safe using the chemistry, they're more than likely either not going to use it when they're not being watched, or they're going to use it incorrectly. And I have seen that where I've inter interviewed a truck wash manager and said, "Okay, here's." He, and he's telling me, here's what we do, and here's the chemistry we use. And then he went off to a meeting, and I turned around to the operators and said, okay, now tell me what you really do. And, he, and they said, well, this chemistry, it burns our skin, it burns our eyes, and it's, if he's not standing here watching us, we don't even disinfect. So uh, the chemistry, you, know, you, you have to make those workers understand not only why it's important when what they're doing, but they have to feel comfortable that they can use it and do it safely in order to do it effectively. Okay, thanks, great discussion. Um, do we have any other questions? I do have one question for you guys. I've had a couple um, people asking about um, whether or not they can get a uh, copy of your presentation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll send out a PDF um, file to everyone once I get the attendance report. We do have one more question that came through the chat. Vertical surfaces are a challenge. Do you know of any type of foaming or other agents to ensure contact time? I, I can jump in first, I mean, our, you know, again, the, the products that we offer are all both, I mean, we have variations, but our high foam products um, that are designed for a minimum of 10 minutes of, of cleaning and contact to that surface, I mean, they don't necessarily have to foam for efficacy, but it, it, in the case of vertical surfaces, if that's necessary for contact time, I mean, there's, there's a number of pieces of equipment that are available on the, the, the processing side. Um, that can get you some pretty robust foam, whether it's the introduction of compressed air, if they're battery powered unit or whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, it really depends on the application. I mean, we have both available depending on the surface that you're attacking. So it's not uncommon to have a foaming disinfectant on the um, processing side. Yeah, and on the Burkhan S actually does have about 15% surfactant in there. So it naturally will foam. The more agitation you put into it, the, the greater the foam you'll get. Um, and foam's not only good from a uh, giving you a resonance time on the vertical surfaces, but it gives you a visual indicator of where you've actually applied product. So it's it's very uh, beneficial to have that foaming there, so the operator knows uh, where he's been. Okay. Well, we're nearing the end of our time here, so um, I would like to thank um, both of you for um, your presentation today. They were great. And for anybody else that's on the, uh, still on the line, if you have any ideas for our webinars that the VSNTEP can explore for emergency preparedness, please feel free to contact us. And you can also find other webinars on vaccine and many other topics on the TEP video gallery online, which is posted 
on the APHIS USDA Animal Health Training and PEP video gallery. Um, be sure to watch your emails for upcoming um, information on our, our August webinars. And with that, I do have one more question in the chat. Should water be removed after sanitation on structures slash when clean before production? Um, so I, I can take that one. I kind of mentioned it a little bit and alluded to it. It's I, again, I don't hate I hate to give a gray answer, but it really depends on the proximity to production. I mean, the product proximity to uh, any type of contact surface or what could be a vector for cross contamination further down the line. Um, it, it, if it's an actual sanitizer that's pooling, there are some food safety implications as far as like product contamination that could be there. But if they're used in the proper concentration for leave on sanitizers, that's usually not the case. So it's really, it usually becomes an, uh, a production efficiency question as opposed to food safety question, if that kind of, if that kind of helps. I mean, sometimes your process isn't going to be as effective if there's pooling, you know, there's the, the uh, personal health issue that's related there as far as like slip trips and falls. But if you're using it based on the um, concentration and the actual application instructions on that label, in most cases, a pooled sanitizer would not need to be removed. Okay, thanks for that answer. And with that, um, I'm going to wish you all a great rest of your day and thanks again for this presentation. And I'll be in touch with sending you the PDF once I get the attendance report. Thanks very much, all.